been uh, this has been a very enjoyable effort uh, talking to people who were involved with the redevelopment. Um, I think it's time to memorialize it, you know, in terms of audio and visual, uh, before we lose that record and better can learn from it. Uh, on that. So we sent you a, you know, an email with some. I actually mailed it here. But actually, I if it. I can start with something that wasn't on the email. Okay. Because uh, it's very important. Can you tell us something about yourself, you know, where you grew up and your connection to the city? That, uh, if you, before we get into the, the why and the who and the what. Sure. I, um, I'm, a, I'm a Jersey girl. <laughs> All right. I was born and grew up in Newark. Mm -hmm. And I'm an urban person. Mm -hmm. Grew up in Newark, uh, went to college in Washington, D.C. and uh, settled in New Brunswick as a young bride. So, uh, you know, you get me out in the country and uh, I'm a little bit lost. I like the fact that a bus stops at my corner. I might say that I haven't been on a bus in 20 years, but I like the fact that it's there. And uh, can walk out and get a loaf of bread or whatever. And um, I was married to a uh, local boy from, uh, actually lived in Highland Park, but was born in St. Peter's, went to St. Peter's High School, and uh, ultimately went to Georgetown Law School and was deeply committed to New Brunswick. And uh, I'm not sure at the time, but it was really my first choice. I mean, we were having a wonderful time in Washington, D.C. I worked there. He was at law school there, and uh, it was a great place. I could travel for free. And, uh, lots of friends there and so on, but no. Uh, so when he died, I uh, felt we already made the commitment, and uh, this was where he wanted to raise his family, and so uh, the well-being of the Brunswick was very important to me. And uh, as I say, the commitment had been made, and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> here I am. So what kind of work did you do in Washington, D.C.? I was with the Air Transport Association. I did mm -hmm. wage and salary surveys, uh, oh, okay. union agreements, that kind of thing. Hmm. And uh, it was the labor relations arm of the Air Transport Association. Hmm. Interesting. Yes, I've been fortunate. My jobs were always quite satisfying. And, and just for our own record. Um, the mayors who were before your term in New Brunswick, do you recall? We're just trying to... S oh, sure. The, we defeated an administration that had been in office for 27 years. And uh, Mayor Paulus had been Chester Paulus. Chester had, Paulus? Mm-hmm. P-A-U-L-U-S. Like the street out there. Uh, Paulus Boulevard, Paulus, Paulus Dairy. Um, it had been, at that point, for some years, a commission form of government. And uh, he had been the mayor on at least two or three terms in the overall administration. Mm -hmm. Some of the bodies may have changed, but they'd been in office for 27 years, which I think was you know, the root, in many ways, of our problems, but also of our success. And, and, and since, you know, we've been talking in part about the mayor, you, your platform, you have someone who was in office, you know, so many years. Uh, your platform or your desire to, to change when you ran was? Well, um, a typical comment is um, that we called ourselves, we were a slate of five. There was a five commission, five member commission, governing body. Uh, we called ourselves the new five. We called them the old five. They called themselves the good five. <laughs> and um, so that was pretty symptomatic of, of where, we, where we stood. I think the importance of our success was emphasized by running as a team, despite the fact that uh, commission form is, in effect, fiefdoms. And um, I'm not sure necessarily how close a relationship they had with each other, but built into the system was the fact uh, 
you know, your public safety director, you want to hire four more policemen and get uh, uh, a new patrol car. Well, um, I'm uh, public works, and what kind of a garbage truck am I going to get in return for supporting you? Mm -hmm. So as a system, it called for horse trading. And um, not necessarily um, in any priority basis. Um, could be. And, but, uh, and, and this was the way it had been, or this was? Oh, yeah, that's the, typical of the Wall Shack communities. Okay. I don't know how. Are you from New Jersey originally? I'm um, not from New Jersey, but I've been here since. Uh, yeah. I was born in Patterson, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Great Falls. So yes. Pat Kramer took me there one day and we saw a right. rainbow. I said, right. how do you arrange that? <laughs> Can I turn on rainbows in your country? But, but just so I understand, you know, and you have different commissioners that are in charge of different interests. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, and then when you came in with your five, it was more coordinated. You said you ran as a team. So Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that was key in that we were able to uh, work together and it didn't the system although well a perfect example was um, and I'll get to DCA in a minute but a perfect example was there was provision in the law for each of the commissioners to have an administrative assistant um, so we each appointed the same person so that we had a full-time manager, in effect. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, one of the incumbents that we had defeated uh, took us to court over it, that it was illegal, you can't have that, no, no, no. And so we each hired, in effect, one-fifth of a person. And that gave us a coordination that had never existed before. Mm -hmm. And so that was key. There was no provision for a city administrator or a city manager under that form of government. Mm -hmm. And this was using the system, we thought, as a more effective way, because although it's the only 24 hour a day part-time job in the world, the fact remained that we all had jobs of our own uh, to feed the family, which was a little important. And this was a way of having a full-time person. Mm. The other part of that um, that was critical, and I'm not so sure uh, it can always be replicated, and I would like to talk a little bit about what I think of as a contribution, but in particular, uh, when we took office, we were almost, um, almost just a little bit behind the establishment of the Department of Community Affairs. Paul Ilbesacker was the first director, and as you might guess, I as a new mayor certainly wanted to make my mark, and even more importantly, he as a new commissioner in a new department wanted to make his mark. Mm -hmm. He had some money. I had no money. <laughs> and so uh, we had a very close relationship. He supplied us interns. He supplied us an interim manager. He had a kind of executive loan program. And so we had the mayor, uh, the manager of, mm, I think it was Woodbridge, assigned to us at no cost to us, because we had no money, uh, for six weeks to try to organize. Um, City Hall was clearly a, a creature of the 19th century, and we really had to bring it to the 20th mm -hmm. century. Hmm. I mean, if I wanted to communicate with Commissioner Listovic, Listovic, List of King. Okay, I'm, I'm horrible on names. I'm worse on dates. So <laughs> trust okay. nothing that I say because I'll gargle it. But in any case, I had a memo. The the previous administration clearly ran under the rule: don't write anything down. Mm -hmm. In this day and age, it was would be don't send any emails. Right. It can come back and bite right. you in the right. tail. But um, if I had a memo, I mean, I came out of the corporate world, so I thought in terms of memos. Um, it was typed up on bond paper, 
very high quality, expensive bond paper with a gold seal. It was put in an envelope and uh, our mail person, George Hall, at the end of the day collected all the mail, walked downstairs across the courtyard into the post office, deposited the mail. And the next morning, he went over to the post office and collected the mail and delivered it to the offices. And that's how you got your memo. So there was a lot to be done to bring it into the 20th century, mm -hmm. just in the nits and grits. And um, I think we were contributing in that. Uh, the other uh, really important thing was that we were open to share. I mean, we had the task force of the Chamber of Commerce come in just to look at business practices, a la the memo, first class mail, to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to go downstairs and upstairs. Um, they estimated, I think, for me to buy a box of stationery, a box of pencils, a box of anything, uh, somebody handled a piece of paper 17 times. So there was that kind of thing, and um, but we, you know, we weren't too proud to ask for help, and I think that, that that's key. I mean, I can't help but think of it a lot lately with uh, with Cory Booker in Newark and mm -hmm. with Obama. Um, they're not ashamed to say they don't know everything, and they're not anxious to look back. Um, and punish or investigate or, because mm -hmm. I mean, if half the rumors that we heard were true, and I'm sure they weren't all true, but if half the rumors, we could have spent the first year just chasing people down to try to put them in jail. Right. That would accomplish nothing. And so uh, we, we looked forward and looked for all the help we could get. We were not shy about asking for help. And the, the stars were in alignment, a la Governor Hughes and Paul Ilbesacher. Um, also the fact that, um, I mean, there was room to repair almost everything. Uh, in those days, the town and gown was not a matter of cooperative. I mean, they only threw bricks at each other. There was no discussion, no re relevancy. Was that uh, when Mason Gross was yeah. president? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, we would talk to Mason Gross, and he, uh, I don't know if you were here when John McDonald was here, but he was, uh, he was the go-to guy, as it were, uh, an ombudsman for the university with the city government and uh, for the city government with the university. Mm -hmm. And again, there was a willingness cooperate and share and help out with problems. I mean, up to that time, really, um, you could hardly get anyone from Rutgers to admit that they were in New Brunswick. Oh yeah, we're outside of Princeton, yes. They didn't live in New Brunswick and they didn't admit to being in New Brunswick. And the only thing New Brunswick was useful for was some kind of social services survey or a graduate student thesis. Um, and they didn't look on it as a way to help the organization of city government or to help the school system, mm -hmm. rather for their, their own interest. And there had been a long history of that, and I'm not trying to say this side was right or that side was wrong, but that's the way it was. So what year did you become mayor? 67. 67. Right, Sasha, if we could um, start with I can imagine the reasons why the efforts to redevelop the city, but if I can get your perspectives on what they were. Well, I think um, I was really a step behind that. You can't think about redevelopment when you're trying to think about survival. And the 60s uh, was, was chaos. Um, and so what what we offered, which I think was perhaps we a step about, in the about chaos in the times, or, Urban, the, or, or yes. in, in New Brunswick specifically. Or no, I'm, I'm talking about the times. Right. I mean, uh, 
the National Guard was patrolling Newark. Plainfield was in flames. Uh, Trenton was not much better. And um, nobody w was talking to anybody. And there had to be some stability and some recognition of trying to make things work for the people who lived and worked in New Brunswick or in Newark or Camden or Plainfield or wherever. And so um, I think uh, we laid a good groundwork for redevelopment, but we weren't at a point of thinking of redevelopment. We were thinking of survival and stability. So if you can speak some about trying to stabilize the survival mode, like what you mentioned the platform you ran on or the group of five trying to coordinate, but what would be some other aspects in this pre-development stage? Well, I think that um, I, I use the word stability, but I mean, when I got to your thing, it uh, kind of made me think back, and as I said, some of the memories are very, very happy, some of them are a little uh, intense, but to set it in the scene, I think New Brunswick, like most of our other cities, not only in New Jersey but elsewhere, um, were, victim is too strong a word, but they were uh, a harbinger of the times, of um, unintended consequences. For example, um, Nothing could be more advantageous and more um, delightful and more justified than the GI Bill and the Highway Act. I mean, I think they were both wonderful programs. But what they did was tie a noose around the cities. The highways provided the way out of the cities. Uh, it for, and the GI Bill fostered housing developments. They would not, the Kendall Parks of the world would not have been built, or at least not, or the Levittowns of the world would not have been built with the same speed. And they offered our GIs housing, but they pro, uh, did not provide them with a choice because the housing stock in the cities mm -hmm. was too old and didn't qualify. Mm -hmm. I mean, my husband couldn't get a, a GI loan for us to buy a house in the Brunswick. So, so are you referring to like they couldn't get uh, FHA insurance in, in New Brunswick um, if they wanted to buy? Because the houses were more than 30 years old. So... And, and that was the FHA policy at the mm -hmm, time? If it was mm -hmm. more than 30 years old, yeah. you couldn't get insurance? You couldn't get a mortgage. It wasn't a matter of insurance, it was a mortgage. Could not get a mortgage. And that, so that, that was because of FHA and bank redlining? Of, of no, it had stuff? nothing to do with redlining, I don't think, although there was that too. But that was not as much of a problem as the fact that um, the federal benefits were set up in such a way that the cities were deprived of participating, and that helped with the city the stamps. That's right. So now you have New Brunswick in 1967 where uh, more than a third of the land area is tax exempt. Uh, more than a third of the residents are over 65. And more than a third of the residents are school age. The school age population primarily was in public housing and the over 65 was primarily in grandma's house. Mm -hmm. 25 foot lot, um, you know, nose to, cheek to jowl all around the side streets of New Brunswick. And so much of the quote racial crisis was really a generational thing. Uh, you know, mama and papa, or maybe just mama, is now living in this 25 foot house um, that raised two or six children. They're all educated and they're all living in Kendall Park or North Brunswick or yeah. South Brunswick. They didn't, a lot of them didn't go very far away, but they were out of New Brunswick who wouldn't want a new house and a car and a driveway. The, this, is the, this is the children of the, of the That's right. over six months. 
And, uh, and the other alternative was that the over 65 now retired and went to Florida. In both instances, we now have uh, slum landlords, in effect. Um, the kids aren't going to live in that house themselves. And here's the Rutgers population. We'll divide it up into 16 units and charge the kids by the head. And they all have a car on streets that are this narrow. They may or may not have enough to park one car. So suddenly the neighborhoods are going to hell in a basket. And so that was kind of forces beyond the control of New Brunswick, Newark, or wherever. I mean, that was typical of our cities. Uh, that we were in effect becoming warehouses for the poor and the old. And um, in order to get past, <coughs> excuse me, in order to get past that, you had to bring people together and say, no, we're not going to decide everything in this town. I mean, it was easy in some ways for us to say, no, you're not being excluded, we want you in. Because everybody had been excluded. Unless you were at the Elks Club at 4 o'clock on a Tuesday, you weren't deciding anything. So it wasn't a matter that minorities were excluded. Everybody was excluded, except the, the old guard, the entrenched machine. You talked some about the retail uh, changes. You spoke some about the housing yes. changes that were going on. Retail that that was something we all had to cope with. And the breakdown of the neighborhoods because of the cars and the multi-use, the illegal uh, zoning and so on. <coughs> the illegal me. conversions. Of, yes, of, uh, yes. Uh, um, you know, years later, my daughter and my son, the two, the oldest and the youngest, went to Penn. And ultimately, both of them lived in apartments in South Philly, and it was just like uh -huh. New Brunswick. You know, we need maintenance, zoning. Right. Not there, but somebody making a lot of money. Uh, in terms of retail, um, that followed the, the automobile and the malls. I mean, you went to Kendall Park and you shopped in uh, Corvettes or Two Guys or. Woodbridge Mall when it came, and so on. And those are problems that all of the cities faced. It isn't unique to New, Brun to New Brunswick. We were fortunate in, in a way that, although we didn't have much retail, we had some merchants and local businessmen who got on the bandwagon with us in terms of st stability, and in terms of improving the downtown. Um, I mean, I was almost burned in effigy because um, we proposed to eliminate parking on George Street. George Street is very I narrow, know, right. and it used to have parking on both sides. Right. I think there were a total of 62 meters. Shoppers didn't get to park in them. The people who worked in the offices in the stores tied up those meters all day, so it did not help parking. Mm -hmm. But it was a symbolic thing that was going to destroy downtown. Nobody could move downtown because the traffic was so bad. But so we, we did. We eliminated uh, parking, uh, eliminated the meters on George Street. Uh, and provided parking. I mean, the Wolfson Light came along about that time, and uh, then the Church Street Light, you know, they all followed, and you had to have parking, and we didn't have any parking. And the fact of the matter is that if you went to Woodbridge Center more, um, three out of four of you were parked further away from the store than you were if you parked in downtown New Brunswick to the store. But you could see the store. It wasn't around the corner or down the lane. And um, the crime in the, I mean, I hate to sound like we were just picked on by the world, but it's true. Urban areas were. Um, number one, Woodbridge Center, for an example, had its own security. 
they were under orders not to report to the local police. The pocketbook snatching, the car stealing, the uh, vandalism with the aerials, and so on. Yet every court case that ultimately came to court, of course, came to New Brunswick because that's where the courts were. Mm -hmm. And so the byline in the paper for every petty thievery incident was in New Brunswick. I see. But, but it had occurred. In Woodbridge Center, at Menlo Park, or uh, wherever. No. Um, but back to advantages, that very question. Um, was one we raised with the paper, the New Brunswick Home News at that time was indeed a, a local paper. I said, look, you know, every crime in the county can't be reported as if it were in New Brunswick. And they changed the policy, uh, which made a difference. I mean, uh, I think one thing we had going for us that I'm not so sure is true today was that the institutions of the community were willing to exercise some corporate responsibility, corporate citizenship, mm -hmm. if you will. I mean, today I think you'd call it conflict of interest or uh, graft, but I uh, uh, virtually uh, strong armed the community, business community, to support pools. I mean, Ricky Dink pools, above ground pools, but because the, there was no, no uh, place or thing for the children to do. The Home News bought a pool, Johnson & Johnson bought a pool, Squibb bought a pool, the Downtown Merchants bought a pool, and not a big deal, but it was the first time anybody had done something for the youngsters who were, like, on tether hooks at that time. And I'm not sure they do that today. And uh, just one other, your perspective on the urban renewal that started in the late 40s and 50s and continued, how was that playing out in New Brunswick? And well, that was playing out the same way it plays out every other place. Um, again, what I think of as unintended consequences. I mean, I had three children of my own and I love them dearly, but High rises where 75, 80 percent of the uh, inhabitants of those high rises, speaking of Memorial Homes, which is still gone, is now gone, thank God. Um, the children ruled it, and they were unruly, unsupervised children, sub teens and teenagers. I mean, you know, I'm not talking about the mob came in and ruled it. I'm talking about unruly kids. I mean, you get to the 11th floor and there's two people on that whole floor that are over 18 in terms of residence. I went door to door in memorial homes and uh, I want to tell you that it would make you cry. I mean, you had young mothers who were hardly more than kids themselves. They couldn't ride the elevator. They couldn't take the baby downstairs because they were intimidated and harassed mm -hmm. by kids and kids urinating in the elevator and throwing sticks and nothing virtually criminal, but virtually inhabitable. And I think, uh, you know, talk about Chicago, Philadelphia, and Newark, New Brunswick, they had to go. And the other part that made Memorial Homes very difficult uh, for future urban renewal was that uh, we had a pretty stable minority population and um, they were pushed out of, you might not have liked, and I can't really remember them, uh, but the housing they were in, which is what became... Um, the old areas by yes, the river. Right, basically. right. Became memorial homes, families were separated, there was no real effort, uh, and I don't think that's true only in New Brunswick, I assume it was true around the country, um, of replacement and mm -hmm. replacement housing and keeping families together and so on. And so that, that memory was still very raw, which made housing development um, 
a very difficult path. But uh, back to DCA, the Housing Finance Agency in New Jersey, um, you know, I got more than my share. Uh, you know, I was there all the time with the tin cup and the big mouth, and uh, we had uh, some some real successes in terms of the bond factory uh, out on Remsen Avenue for senior citizen housing, the UAW housing down here, over there. Um, on, the ne on Commercial Avenue, the low-rise housing, but A, I think... And that was, you had a receptive ear in DCA, and also you were proactive in moving yeah. these projects? Big out. mouth helps. Okay. Big mouth helps. <laughs> I've got to tell Well, I'll give you a perfect example. There on, um, I mean, the rules are wonderful and generally serving but they don't always come out as a practical matter. Um, the ones we built on um, Commercial Avenue there, just as you come up opposite the Bishop Towers, uh, they were going to be two-story, but we had identified a need for larger apartments because of larger families, and so it went to three stories. And they said, well, if you have three stories, you have to have an elevator. And I said, over my dead body, you're going to have an elevator. The that was ones, because it become too expensive? No, it had nothing to do with expense. It came to do with safety. safety. You ride up and down in the elevators, if they happen to be working in memorial homes. You were threatened. You were unsafe. It smelled like urine at best. Sometimes it smelled much worse. They said, no elevators. You know, I went to a grammar school that had three stories. And all those little kids were able to go up and down stairs. Right. People who have children and want to be on the third floor, they're going to have to walk. No, federal guidelines, third, th three stories, you got to have I said, no, no. And it was the first going through, you know, of course, there was a sensation going through HFA because it wasn't the rules and so on. But um, as a practical matter, if you had any hope of maintaining the safety and the ambiance, if you will, of what was really nice housing. Elevators were a source of problem. It was no different than when we were having some kind of a little unrest at uh, wherever, the university or the high school or the job corps or whatever. The first thing you did was uh, close the gas stations and the bars. Well, when you're building housing, the first thing you do is you build it so it doesn't need an elevator. <laughs> well, if we can turn to some of the the who of the redevelopment, uh, maybe starting with J and J. Well, J and J was key, and I, you know, John, John Heldrich was on your list, and I mean, really can begin and end with him. Richard Sellers was another key player from Johnson and Johnson, and. Um, on my other hat, I like to think that I was a bit of a player as well. Um, the decision to stay in New Brunswick, despite the fact that it would be painless and easy for them to have gone almost anywhere else. They own more than enough acreage in Somerset County that it could have gone out and built the world-class headquarters without even blinking an eye. To stay in New Brunswick and take the abuse of the uh, marshalling together the parcels of land. Um, I mean, there were some, they formed a real estate company or whatever agent to acquire the property for what is now World Headquarters site. And um, that was taken by some as a diabolical plot. Um, taken by others as a gold mine at the end of their rainbow. You know, they couldn't have sold the property for 25 cents, but now, because J&J is buying it, because they've opened that screen of secrecy, uh, now it's worth a million dollars, plus. <laughs> and so, uh, the fact that they committed to that very critical decision when the other alternatives were so much easier for them 
and, and uh, was why, key. why do you think, what prompted them coming to that decision? You don't think the novenas I made counted, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jane Jay has a very uh, strong sense of public responsibility, and uh, they're a company driven by what they call the credo. And um, they had a much closer identity um, with the communities in which they're located than many other corporations have. And so I think that ethic had a lot to do with it. That's not to say that it was a unanimous decision by a long shot, but there were, you know, there were enough John Heldriches in that room um, to see that it happened. And they were also willing um, to fight the fight with me uh, for Route 18. I don't know if you were around yes. when we had yes, the pillars. Again, I, I would very much appreciate your yeah. perspective and time. Oh, oh. <laughs> I can tell you. I mean, they had the pillars in the highway that came to a stop. And um, it was not the shining hour for the Rutgers students either, I might add. Uh, but in any case, that was an area where the entire community of both political parties um, and layers of government all got together. I mean, we had at that time now a Governor Cahill, we had then Secretary of State Ed Crabiel, who was you know, holding, holding over until Cahill got his act together or his scheme together. We had uh, Pete Williams, we had Ed Patton, um, we have all of the assembly and senate and all of the county and J&J uh, &J was leading the uh, private sector and I was leading the governmental sector and I mean we were back and forth to Washington so often and one of the highlights or happy memories, I'm not quite sure how to say that, uh, there must have been 17 of us in a meeting in Washington representing, as I say, every level of government. And um, the Army Corps of Engineers and the Coast Guard and all the federal agencies that were, were around, uh, candidates for the assembly walked across the Rarit and had their pictures taken, um, Bill Hamilton and, and Joe Valenti. Uh, to point up the ridiculousness of this property uh, because above the railroad bridge going whatever that direction is, north I guess, um, the water was not navigable. So I, I don't understand, what was the controversy about Route 18? What had to be stopped? The um, Federal rules said that you cannot, um, you know, interfere with a navigable waterway. Well, this was to build a bridge across it. Correct. Okay. And um, the only way you could move traffic in or out of New Brunswick, I mean, with the Rutgers people, we went down, or I guess Rutgers sent people down to, where is it, West Virginia, where they have that rail system between two campuses mm -hmm. to see if that kind of a thing would work. But the water was not navigable, and that was the key argument. And the answer was, well, it had once been navigable, I can't even say it, uh, before the railroad bridge. But the railroad bridge made it moot. But in any case, it took everybody, and there we are all around the table like this, Every vested interest you could think of with whatever hat on and finally we've got to go. Everybody nods their heads, thanks for time. So Can you there believe was what, it? determination it was not navigable or, or, or? We all, yeah. in this room, yes, everybody's got every piece of paper that they need and what isn't needed comes tomorrow. We weren't back in New Brunswick before. More roadblocks were, were there. 
So the 18 bridge, and at, by that point, J&J &J had made that a, a, a prerequisite. They weren't going to build a world headquarters if they couldn't get people in and out. And so that was an ongoing fight where I had everybody on my side, and I was still losing. I mean, it was difficult. And it ultimately, you know, we got the approvals and the permits from everybody, and we have the bridge. You get stuck on it every day now. <laughs> so it was built then in the early 70s? Mm-hmm. Okay. But the pillars had been there beforehand. So we've spoken about J and J before. You had spoken briefly about Rutgers, but again, where was Rutgers in this redevelopment effort? Back well, then? Mason Gross and after him, Ed Blaustein mm -hmm. were very supportive and interested in New Brunswick. Now that they had um, people who weren't running as a platform anti-Rutgers. I mean, that was the secret to success in the earlier years. Rutgers didn't pay any taxes. Uh, I mean, it was John Lynch Sr., and I can't remember now even when it was, it's certainly before my time, but he, through the legislature, got a $5,000 in lieu of taxes payment to the city. And that had been the case for the next 20 years, we got $5,000. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that being a, a very low amount, obviously. Uh, uh, yes, uh, it's been significantly increased. Uh, uh, Bobby Willens was, was very helpful in, in increasing those payments. But, um, so anybody that ran for office in New Brunswick, or perhaps even in the county, although I'm not sure of that, certainly in New Brunswick, ran against Rutgers, you know, dirty rotten Rutgers. And, and that was because of this low tax payments and the impacts of students yeah. with the housing that you mentioned. Yeah, earlier. I mean, what did the city get from having, Rutgers wouldn't admit they were in the city, right. they contributed nothing, uh, they didn't live in the city, so they weren't even taxpayers, and they were nothing but a drain, and that's the way the argument went. But, um, you know, we, as I say, I wasn't shy with my tin cup, and um, we were willing to talk to Rutgers and work with Rutgers, and uh, certainly Mason Rose and Ed Blaustein in return. I mean, he, Ed made, oh, no, I can't remember his name, the planning director. Bill Wright? No, no, before him. Um, oh. I want to say Clyde, and it's not it. As I told you, I'm terrible on names. But in any case, he um, and his uh, staff and his graduate students did a lot of work for and about the city of New Brunswick. Mm. And that kind of thing just wouldn't have happened before. What, what guys doing studios and, and being in No, looking and at and the land, uh, the land off Route 1 by Farrington Lake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Looking at Farrington Lake itself, uh, looking at various infrastructure improvements. Oh, he had his hand in everything. I can see him, and I can't think of his name. Hmm. But um, so we're, yeah, but they were they were late to the table, um, but not always their own fault. They weren't they were invited to the table either. Uh, so lots of wrongs on both sides, but. Yes, Rutgers did become a partner. The, the hospital, where, and I realized it was then Middlesex, General. Middlesex and St. Peter's. The goodness. hospitals were key. In many ways, they were uh, certainly not more important than, than Johnson & Johnson, but the hospitals, unlike Johnson & Johnson and unlike Rutgers, their employees, one ran the whole gamut, from somebody who sweeps the floor to the neurosurgeon, to a large percentage of their employees, uh, both of the medical staff and of the maintenance staff, lived in New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. So the hospitals were our largest single employer, mm -hmm. and the employment was the gamut, which was very important. It wasn't only the bottom or only the top. Um, 
they had a long history of service to New Brunswick. And um, although they didn't pay taxes either, uh, they do pay their water bill, and that was <laughs> significant income. Uh -huh. I mean, it's hard to believe how little money we had um, and how difficult it is to make infrastructure improvements. I mean, everybody loves to come and dedicate a building or have their picture on a wall, but to replace a sewer that's 100 years old and leaking, that ain't too glamorous. Mm -hmm. um, the condition of our stuff was deplorable. I mean, the trucks were a zillion years old, half of them didn't work. The police department had no, I mean, now everybody has a cell phone. Then they had only a handful of walkie talkies and they didn't work because they didn't have batteries. There was no training provided for the police department. Um, they did have training for the fire department. Um, but we had, in both cases, and most particularly the fire department, we had a paid fire department. And I mean, I had arguments with the, the mayor and the fire uh, personnel in Highland Park, for example. You know, why can't you get a new truck? You have to borrow our ladder truck. Why aren't you getting a new truck? Uh, and I said, well, anytime you want to take over our payroll, I'll buy you all the trucks in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to denigrate the volunteer firemen. They're wonderful. Um, I at one point had suggested that perhaps we hire women firefighters so that we wouldn't have to pay them to sleep on the job. I mean, when there's a fire, nothing is more important than a fireman. Mm -hmm. But if there's not a fire and there's a dormitory, I'm paying these guys to sleep. Right. If we had women, their wives wouldn't let them sleep there. And I would, <laughs> you know, we'd go from the sublime to the ridiculous. Right. But, um, and that was again true of, of so many of the cities. Uh, their payroll costs precluded them are making infrastructure improvements, capital improvements. Um, the people of New Brunswick, like any place else, were entitled to adequate public services. And that, if we had one slogan, that was it. Their streets should be clean, their snow should be removed, they should be safe from fire or crime, and uh, Whatever it took in terms of beg borrowing and stealing, we were ready to do to make that happen. And, and I guess the basic problem was as gradables left or didn't grow, you really, and there was such a heavy dependence on local resources to pay for services, the resources just weren't there. That's right, that's and, back to the warehouses. And, uh, mm -hmm. If I can just Turn to some of the other actors. We mentioned J and J. We mentioned Butkers. You started to speak about the state, and I think uh, with Paul Oversocker as, as the founding commissioner of DCA, that, that was the, the best fortuitous thing. He needed to make his mark, and where was I? The perfect laboratory. He had a check. I had, took everyone I could get, and as I said, got more than my share. And that was supported by Governor Hughes, and it was supported again by Governor Cahill. I mean, just in the funny side stories, when I was mayor of New Brunswick, Pat Kramer was commissioner of community affairs. And when I became commissioner of community affairs, Pat Kramer went back to being mayor of Patterson. And, um, he was a Republican, I was a Democrat, and neither was, was, was ashamed of that. We were kind of proud of it. Um, but we worked together, and you talk about the urban crises in the cities in the 70s. That was not a partisan issue. I mean, if you were in the city, you were in need. And um, the, the, the county? Well, the county, I've come down on both sides of that. In some instances, I think to myself, um, you know, we pay the freight, 
bill, the tax bill that goes out in my name supports the county and we have no choice except to dole it out. There's no mayor on there that says the freeholders are collecting X or mm -hmm. Y or Z. So as the taxes go up, it's the mayor's problem. And, um, you know, there's prisons, there's hospitals, there's parks. Now, of course, there wasn't them, but now there's a county college. Um, some days, even then and since, I've said, well, it makes no sense to have 567, excuse me, now 566 municipalities and 21 counties. If there's one thing we got too much of, it's government. Why don't we have county regional government? Mm -hmm. But then I look at what they do and I think, that doesn't work. It does not work. We should have regional services, but uh, for a current question, for example, we're worse off with school districts, you know, 617 school districts. Right. They've put in a county superintendent of schools, but all that's done is add another layer. Yeah, they don't have any there, power. There's no, there isn't a county director of schools. Yes, yeah, right. Which in my heart makes a lot of sense, yeah. but I'm not going to talk about the educational issue. But so that I'm not sure, I've never really been comfortable um, with what the counties contribute versus what they cost. Um, I mean, we had a proposal in the depths of despair here uh, when we were, um, you know, trying to get Route 18 built, trying to get Jay and Jay to stay, uh, trying to save what little is left of retail downtown. One of the freeholders said, well, you know, we've got all this land out there at Camp Kilmer, maybe we should move the county administration building. <laughs> I mean, how is that going to help New Brunswick? Right. And, uh, you know, he got kind of laughed off the table on that, but he was dead serious. And then his next thing was, well, you know, we really have to renew, uh, maybe we should build an arena in downtown New Brunswick. Yeah, it's not being discussed. Yeah, a big walled-in arena, 365 days of the year, it has to turn on the lights, and you're lucky if you have 17 days of the year with events. Yeah. So the, the county, as an institution, um, could have played a pivotal role and did not, is in my experience. The, the business community, other than J&J, &J, like local banks and others, where, where were they? The business community, well, J&J, &J, I think from the very beginning of their involvement, you know, because I worked with John a lot in how redevelopment could work and where it was working. If it was it Frank, Frank White, whatever, somebody up in Connecticut, anyway, who's the greater Hartford process. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we talked to them and so on. Um, but a key position for J and J was they were not going to do it alone. They didn't want to be that far out front. Uh, they were getting more than their share of brickbats for what they were doing. And if it was going to be sustainable, it had to be a group effort. And you know, that drive helped drive New Brunswick tomorrow. And so on the other side of it, um, as I say, one of, I think the hallmarks of my administration was bring everybody to the table. I mean, the ministers and the priests and the rabbis were key in the term of uh, the, the unrest when the school, the university or the high school or job corps, any of them were out on the streets. Um, they were key in restoring order or maintaining peace and that involved communication. And they were part of the development. I mean, the churches in this town and the temple were significant institutions with long histories, and they had a lot to lose. I mean, they were already losing their congregations, but they came back for services. I mean, half of New Brunswick 
or half of North Brunswick came to St. Mary's, half of Highland Park came to uh, Anshe Emmet, and um, so that those institutes, so they were part of New Brunswick tomorrow. And the banks, uh, thank God for my sake and New Brunswick's sake, in those days, there were not all the mergers. I mean, my poor mother-in-law, when she died, we tried to settle her little bank account, which was nothing. I mean, I think it was seven different banks. Yeah. Uh, you know, merger, and, you know, never got the new check. Oh, well, another story. But, but we had my jar bank, we had New Brunswick Savings Bank, they were both corporate offices here, and they too had something to protect and a future to look for. And so uh, the uh, religious community, the financial community, the retail community, uh, such as it was, the, the local businesses, you know, you had Jack Gushin who took on the parking authority and, and was a mover and a shaker. Sid Sokoloff had a little jewelry store on, yeah. on George Street. Fantastic willingness to step up and be part of a group effort. And it also, I don't want to say gave J&J &J coverage, but it gave J&J &J the opportunity to be a part of something that clearly was to their benefit, given the decision to stay. The, the neighborhoods, the ethnic communities, where, where were they in, in this process? Well, the um, black community, if you can call it that, uh, which of course we did at that time, we were fortunate, much more fortunate than um, many other places in that we had a strong middle class, second or third generation black population in New Brunswick. And so there was a stability there that certainly burning down the town wasn't going to help them or their children or their families or their jobs. And uh, the Hungarian community had a, a very stable set up over here in the Fifth Ward. And again, they had a little bit of an age problem because those houses in the Fifth Ward in particular were little teeny houses. And, um, but the difference there was Mama was still living in it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I come along and I'm taxing them out of their home. They've lived there for 65 years and now suddenly. But they're the only taxpayers around. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is gone or it's tax exempt. And so uh, the Hungarian, and part of, part of that was helped by the um, tradition that we carried on in that the um, city commission had been and under us was, and then the subsequent mayor and council were ethnically diverse. Um, let's say it was Smith, Cahill, Cooper, Valenti, and Sheehan. Smith was Hungarian, Cahill was Irish, um, Smith, Cahill, Valenti was Italian, Cooper was black, Sheehan was not only Irish but a woman which really gave pause to the ethnic communities. I mean, thank goodness for me, my father didn't live in town. He wouldn't have anything to do with petticoat government. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't have petticoat voted. Government. Yeah, I wouldn't have voted for a woman. <laughs> so, um, um, the city government really reached out to represent everyone, gave the sense that everyone had a voice and um, in some ways even more so under the commission form, although I think the mayor and council, strong mayor and council was an improvement in terms of maneuvering and getting things done, um, the ethnic communities were very important. And the most important piece of that were the churches and the temples. Uh, I mean, we have more national churches than I had ever seen anywhere before in my life. 
and we had a Hungarian Presbyterian church, we had a Hungarian Catholic church, we had a Polish church, we had an Italian church, we had a German church, of more than one denomination. I mean, it wasn't just Catholic or just Presbyterian or just Unitarian. No. And, and, and the effect of that is you had leaders in these churches and connections to the communities. I'm Absolutely. Trying to understand Absolutely. The back to the redevelopment. Uh huh. And it also meant that they, not only were they at the table, but they had a part in saying, you know, why not here? Or what about here? Um, you couldn't think or do much about redevelopment when you had your finger in the dike. And that's what I was. I had my finger in the dike. Uh, and until you stabilize the downtown and the tax base, you couldn't go out into the neighborhoods. But they, subsequent to me, they were able to do that you know, fix up programs and sidewalks and curbs, potholes. Um, it couldn't all come at once and lots of people were impatient. But it couldn't come at all until you had a stable base. So if I can talk some on sort of the what. Yeah. Yes, because I've talked entirely too much. I'd no. kill for a glass of water if oh, that's possible. I'll get you some, I'm sorry. No. I'll actually get you some uh uh, Poland Springs or something. Oh my goodness. I have tap, New Brunswick tap water is okay. I, know, I, know, I don't know if I have a cup up here. Yeah, but, uh, and I'll, I'll talk for a few minutes while we're while, 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 while. Um, It's been described to us of um, J and J being influenced by some of J and, uh, uh, Johnson, President Johnson's pronouncements on the state of the cities and then looking at what were some models in the United States, um, in part being attracted to what had been done in Hartford as part of the greater Hartford process right. where, you know, industry and government came, came together. Um, that then leading to the creation, I'm just going to mention some things that I'd like to get your take on, uh, um, of New Brunswick tomorrow and, oh, and the concept of partnership, the public and private partnership. Uh, the concept of you need this holistic approach of the development, which then was spun off as the, the development arm of DEVCO, DEVCO, and then New Brunswick Tomorrow subsequently then focusing on you know the softer side or the social side, you know coordinating at, at that end. Um, the J and J's decision to remain and some of the early projects, the the Hyatt. Uh, Etc. So I, I just sort of mentioned that to set the scene. Like, what do you think were some of the key things of, of, of now getting this redevelopment started? Well, I think I've already said uh, key key was the decision of Johnson and Johnson to stay. Uh, concurrently with that, the completion of the Route 18 bridge it'll move people. Uh, I think were two key. Oh, thank you so much. Two key elements. Uh, I was talked earlier about stability. Um, until you had a stable base, you couldn't go anywhere. I mean, you could dream in the sky all the time, but it wasn't going to happen. If you thought the building was going to burn down, and um, so. I would go from there. I think you had city government trying desperately to stabilize and look for resources wherever they were. Uh, I think we benefited by that time they had the Kerner Commission report, mm -hmm. and I think I was the only elected official mentioned favorably in that whole report. Uh, but that helped open the doors for other bits and pieces of aid. So that may have encouraged like some state investment when you say open the doors? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. State and federal. Um, the, the Urban Development Action Grants? I mean, yeah, they came later, that but came yes. Later, and the, the uh, what do they call it? This Where was HUD thing? in all this, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development? HUD worked through 
See, we had a very difficult time because um, Nixon's program really wanted to end HUD. And Jim, oh, what was his name? Jim Lynn, maybe, I think, uh, was the secretary of HUD. And I met with them because around that time is when they put in what they call Section 8 mm -hmm. housing, which was the new urban renewal. Off with the old, on with the new. And I said, you know, what about this project and that project? I mean, we sat around this table. They offered me a cigar. I wasn't interested in the cigar. I wanted to check. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, what's going to happen? This housing, this proposed that. Are you what, fearful of like another memorial homes? I mean, no, it wasn't so much that. I was fearful that the federal government was no longer going to support housing. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't anybody else going to build housing mm -hmm. in the oh, city. Okay. There was no market and no um, financing for anything but subsidized housing. Senior citizen housing, subsidized housing, and now we have Section 8. And I declined the cigar and he said, Pat, you don't have to worry. It's all in the pipeline. You're going to get it. Well, it's not in the pipeline, but... Um, the through, pipeline as far as getting, that New Brunswick would get housing, some housing, housing monies. Housing and, monies. And that, was and section, that was section, section eight. Section eight. And, um, the Department of Community Affairs had a young man. In fact, his wife worked for Rutgers. Well, they'll come to me maybe. I'm so bad on names. But in any case, he worked with uh, Marilyn Berry, who was the governor's Washington office mm -hmm. uh, director. And, uh, you know, the key is always in the details. And the Section 8. I uh, had formulas that I didn't understand then, I don't understand now, and I don't really ever want to understand them. But the formulas for giving out the money are key on any program, but particularly a federal program. And somehow Bruce, Bruce figured out a way so that the age of the housing stock was factored in to the formula as to how much money you'd get and when you'd get it. That was like a gold mine to the city. It's not just New Brunswick, but all the cities, because our housing stock was old. Okay. 30, 40, I mean, the house was, I would, would live in. Was this been. a community development block grants, or, or this was Section 8? This was, was Section 8. Section 8. Right. In doing the formula through Pete Williams' office, uh, and Ed Pat, no, I guess by then it was drier doesn't matter, through our congressional offices and the New Jersey office, the Department of Community Affairs in New Jersey helped craft the formula that made Section 8 work for the cities, despite the national intention that not a nickel of that money was ever going to go to the cities. The cities were democratic, hot, let's, let's you know, let's carve them off and forget them. So that, that was, you know, a key. Now we've gotten totally off on, I've forgotten what your question was. No, no, no. I'd like to hear, you know, what you thought was some other key um, steps or actions. Like I said, you mentioned J&J &J stay, you know, staying, the, the state mm -hmm. cooperating, the change in the formula. Um, any of the particular projects, like either the Hyatt or the Golden Triangle, I mean, that you thought were particularly significant? Well, of course they were significant. Any new construction in any city was significant. And uh, what goes along with that is, in addition to the tax base, which in much of the other stuff, we didn't have, and also um, stability in terms of infrastructure improvements, sewer lines. And, and those were monies that were now coming from the state and federal government mm -hmm. that allowed you to do it, mm -hmm. is, that, is that correct? Right, and, and our own bond issue, and um, 
commitment from uh, the downtown area to work with us and to work with New Brunswick tomorrow and be a part of it. Uh, you know, DEFCO really came later. Uh, you know, the spin-off, as it were, uh, later than my environment. As I say, I'm the kid with the thumb in the dike. Um, but they had to, I lost my train of thought, but... Um, About the benefits of the new construction bringing in additional funding. Yeah, it brings in jobs, it brings in rateables, and it's dependent on a city that's safe, a city where the garbage gets collected, and all the basics that each of us are entitled to are in fact given that the, there's some concern and commitment to public service. I mean, it's as trite as that. Mm -hmm. You have to want to have it work, and you have to be willing to, to listen to people, um, and you have to be able to work with them. If it's, you know, my way or the highway, mm -hmm. that doesn't move the whole ship forward. It ends in impasse. I know many of the projects use the payment in lieu of taxes. Your your perspective on that? Uh, you mean like a tax abatement right. for real estate right. development? Yes. I'm not as well versed in that as I could be because um, my bugaboo, fairly or unfairly, was um, the payment in lieu for tax exempt land. That's not the same as the incentive. Yes for tax abatements, yes. for construction, right. you know, and um, uh, we didn't have any construction, so I didn't have to worry about tax abatement. But so, so did that change over time, the, the payment in lieu on, on the tax exempt, you know, from... from uh, That's the hospitals, the, the hospital, university, the churches. Did, did that change some over time? Well, every time, uh, I know I testified, I think I mentioned earlier, Bobby Willens, um, and Moose Ferran were in the assembly, and they had me down to testify to get the payment up. And I think every mayor passed after me continued to do that. So I think there's some rationale. It's not just that token $5,000 that it was in uh, Senator Irwin Sr.'s time, which was a big deal. Don't misunderstand me. I mean, that at least broke the logjam so that there was an admission on the part of the state. So that number went up some? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's continued to go up every year. One that we could not get up in the um, public housing law at the federal level, there are, I think, three or four categories, um, Alaskans and you know, it's hard for me to really remember. But the fourth category of assistant, assistance payment in lieu is public housing school children. Mm -hmm. And you think, thank God, it's that right? We have a thousand kids in our school system and not one dollar behind them in terms of support. They never funded that provision, ever. Yeah. Never, ever was funded. Yeah. So getting the law whatever that law happened to be, was always only half the battle. And you had to see that funded. get funded. And that's why the other levels of government were so important mm -hmm. to the urban mayors who were really struggling. The big changes occurred after you were mayor, but uh, New Jersey grappled with changing the way it was funding schools and ultimately you had Robinson v. K.O. decision, mm -hmm. ultimately the Abbott decision. Right, and, right, that's all I asked for me. How did that play in into the, or what influence did it have on the redevelopment? Well, I don't honestly know. I can't say from my own personal experience. I know for a fact that uh, the schools in the cities were not, were underfunded. And however you could work out uh, an adequate tax base to support a youngster in school uh, could only be of help to the cities. I know from example 
because I struggled with the, with the federal to get, to get some funding where they'd never funded it. If you have a tax base that provides, I'm sorry, take that back. If you have a community that provides 1,000 youngsters into your school system and not one dollar of tax base support behind that, that only stands to reason that the cost of educating those children falls on the 30% of your tax base, or 30% of your tax base that is taxable. And um, generally, in the case of the cities, on those least, least able to afford it. You know, you're talking about primarily a senior citizen population trying to fund, fund schools uh, because they live in New Brunswick and not in North Brunswick or Livingston or what have you. So that I have a natural tendency to think some kind of, whether it was the KO decision or the Abbott districts and whether they're perfect or imperfect, I don't know. I mean, I haven't been that close to it, but something Certainly. If I can speak briefly on the outcome, you know, from the redevelopment, I guess if you were to give it a grade, you know, what... Um, oh, I'd give it a thousand percent, are you okay. kidding? And, I go to George and, and, Street, and the, I go to the State Theater, and, I eat in all the restaurants, I stay in the Hyatt. Oh, so, so I don't lose the thoughts, because I lose a lot of thoughts. Oh, tell uh, me about it. The Cultural Center. And all this, if I can, was did that come somewhat later after? Well, there were bits and pieces around. I noticed you talked to Eric Krebs right. and to um, Dave Harris. Both of them were very intimately involved in the social service, mm -hmm. cultural, whatever you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And um, it's back to the same story. I mean. Those kinds of institutions brought people back into New Brunswick who'd grown up here. And I can tell you personally, having had at least half a dozen different conversations over some opening or something, not so much now, but when they were first around. Oh, you know, that's the first time I've been in downtown New Brunswick for 20 years. Isn't that amazing? You know, and I lived here for 30 years before that. So that the rumor and the sense of fear, um, I mean, they're, they're going through that right now, trying to get people into downtown New York mm -hmm. with the PAC Center and, and so on. Um, I don't know when I've ever been to a meeting on almost any subject in any place in New Jersey where at least half the people, well maybe that's high, at least a third of the people grew up in Newark. And almost 80% of them haven't been back since, mm -hmm. since they left me. Oh, when I was in Newark. So, so if I can go back to, you know, what was accomplished and maybe if we can speak some with 2020 hindsight, things that could have been done differently, or of course we all have 2020 hindsight. Well, I suppose something that all of us would have liked was that it could have been done faster. Very, very slow. I mean, uh, I've used that in speeches. And, as mayor, you become very, very grateful for the smallest of favors. You know, one step forward is like a miracle. Part of that is the overlapping jurisdictions that we have in New Jersey. I mean, New Jersey's the most overorganized state that there is. It's what, the third or fourth smallest? And mm -hmm. What was it, 617 school districts right. and 566 communities and 21 counties? So that, um, you know, in many ways we can't get out of our own way. 
I told you. We had everybody who was anybody around the table over completing Route 18 bridge. And it wasn't 24 hours later before someone said, oh, well, yeah, but why the way? We think we need this. And so um, it defies logic. But I think if, and I'm not saying that it could have been done faster, but I think that that's a frustration that everybody sir, uh, has. And the other thing I think is that there's a natural tendency, a human nature, if you will, to want to be thanked or to want to be appreciated. And yeah, I don't mind you disagreeing with me, but at least give me credit for trying or caring or spending the time or something. And so when, um, when bricks are thrown, figuratively or literally, you know, that hurts. I think that's, that's part of human nature. And with any evolving process, there was some of that as well. You know, I have more than my share of screaming fights with, you name anybody, <laughs> goes with having the mouth. But um, we were able, at the end of the day, to go and get a pizza, or go and get a beer, or go and get uh, a cup of coffee. And I think that, that that was very, very critical, and we could have and should have had more of that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that's true today, not just in New Brunswick, but everywhere. I mean, whether it's the cable news or the, uh, excuse me, the blogs, mm -hmm. but every motive, every sentence is questioned. Mm -hmm. Every rumor is not only believed, but is spread and magnified. I mean, I didn't have that to contend with. And I also, uh, and we were talking about people who helped, and I left out both the radio station and the newspaper. Mm. And today they don't have either of those, but I had both of them. What was the radio station? WCTC. Oh, that's that still exists. I know, but it's not it's not a hometown WCTC station. And then the home news. And the home news, which was also a hometown newspaper, and is not any mm -hmm. longer. I mean, you read the papers as much as I do, you know what's happening in newspapers. Right. And the radio station's the same. But at this time, they were key pieces. And they were organizations that not only supported the redevelopment in New Brunswick tomorrow mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what we wanted to do, but they kept a fishy eye on it. I mean, they didn't swallow it whole. But you could go and talk to them and say, look, this is what we're planning, this is how we're trying to proceed, this is where you could help. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they, neither of them gave me a blank check, but you could talk to them and, and season it out and sometimes bring them to your way of thinking or agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. But it was civil. Mm -hmm. I don't think that exists today. We don't. If we can, um, I'm sorry. No, no, no that was... How transferable is what has happened in New Brunswick to other urban areas? Of course, I like to think we're unique and made a miracle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but over and above that, there was a certain confluence of stars that I'm not sure you can replicate. A time of unrest where public institutions for the first time had to kind of look at themselves in the mirror and say, you know, how can we help? We've been hindering for too long. And um, a, a willingness on the part of the new and young administration to ask for help and admit that they didn't know everything. And, and this, when you said a new and young administration, um, in New Brunswick, New Jersey. New Brunswick. Us. Okay. Yeah. Yourself. Okay. <laughs> You know, I mean, if it had been um, Mayor Paulus and his administration 
who knew everything and had been here for 27 years, they wouldn't, and I don't mean this in a personal way at all, but just as an institution, they would not seek to talk to kids on the street about what they needed and wanted in recreation. Mm -hmm. uh, just totally against human nature. So I guess the, the timing of your new administration that you, you had mentioned, again, I guess in some of the unique factors, the Elvis soccer and the creation of the Palmer Community Affairs wanting to make its mark. Which again was coming out of, um, you know, a general, um, I mean, when I became Commissioner of Community Affairs, uh, we were able to establish a national organization. But when Paul became, if he wasn't the first nation nationally, he was certainly not only the first in New Jersey, but among the first nationally. Yeah. And that was an idea that spread. There was no voice for the urban areas, the distressed, the old, the warehouses of our country within state governments. Yeah. So, so you know, view. insurance agents had better um, lobbyists, if you will, than, than cities. Uh -huh. So in my hearing more, it was almost a, a unique aligning of the stars? And in some ways, not, yes. Uh, That's not to say that I wouldn't hope and think it can't be replicated. Uh, but if you look again, we had a manageable size. And, and Four and a half, five and a half square miles is like one ward in Newark. Mm -hmm. 50,000 people, a resident population, um, not a strong base. And the fact that we had 125,000 daytime population was a plus in terms of buying and selling and activity, but was a minus in that they strained all the public resources, whether it was parking or shopping or whatever. So, but I think that you see on a national level, at least I do, maybe I'm making it up in my head, but I think there is a a tendency for Obama and his administration on a much broader, grander scale with much more, I mean, I thought I had several wars on my hands, but I mean, I really didn't have war in that sense. Um, but in a willingness to look at new things, new ways, to ask for help and say you can't do it alone, that's pretty rare, and I think that that is a key part of it. Um, Booker, Car Cory Booker mm -hmm. in, in Newark, is doing much the same thing. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think it can be replicated. The bigger it gets, the more um, convoluted the problems are, um, the more difficult it is. But by and large, people don't want to run their city or their town. They want to feel safe. They want things to work the way they're supposed to. You know, the sewers to drain and the potholes to be fixed. And uh, a sense that somebody cares about their well-being. They don't want to go out and do it. Mm -hmm. But they don't want to be shut out of it either. Right. So yes, I think it can be replicated, but it, it takes a lot of goodwill and hard work. Could I just add, get a little bit of chronology again? You became mayor in 67. Correct. And, Correct. And you served until when? Uh, 74. I served seven and a half years of an okay. eight-year term. And then John Lynch came in as mayor? No, Al Cooper came in as oh, mayor. Al Cooper, okay. And how long was he mayor? He was mayor to the end of my term, uh, so that would be the balance of 74. Okay. He was not elected mayor. He succeeded me. Okay. I left in February to go to community affairs. I see. I had not. I had already indicated that I was not going to run for it. Second term was very important to me to prove I wasn't a fluke, if you will. Uh -huh. uh, but I thought two terms. Okay. I made the contribution. So then he came in to finish your term, and then John Lynch ran. No, then oh. Dick Mulligan. Dick Mulligan. And how long was he mayor to you? Uh, I think he was mayor for one term. Four years. So uh, Lynch didn't come in until the late 70s? Mm-hmm. Okay. 
And while you were mayor, were you then working at J and J? Mm -hmm. And what was your position? Uh, I was in. Let's see. I started out in what was then personnel, uh, which is now human resources. Uh -huh. Again, wage and salary surveys, okay. statistical analysis, hiring rates, and so on. Okay. And then um, Jack Mullen started the government affairs department, uh -huh. and um, I moved over there. But to be honest with you, I can't remember. I think that's when I came back after community affairs. Oh, I you went in, back to J&J &J after you were at DCA? Yeah. Okay. See, while I was mayor, part-time job that it is, I continued to work at J and J, but I, I had to quit my job when I, DCA was a full-time job. Right, right, okay. But, but then after DCA, you went back to J and J. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, after the Hackensack Meadowlands, I went back to J and J. I went from DCA to uh, executive director of the Hackensack Meadowlands okay. Commission. Last item of information, you know, where else, who else should we talk to and, you know, do you have files or things we can look at? I have plaques, <laughs> plaques and pictures, uh, but files, no, I didn't, uh, you I, know, some old speeches. The people that we've spoken to and that we will speak to, were there glaring omissions of, I guess, I guess some of the mayors. Yeah, I don't, I don't know either L. Cooper or Dick Mulligan. They, well, Dick there? Mulligan is in Wyoming, so I don't oh, think yes, you can talk to him. Uh, Al Cooper, who was p original part of the New Five, uh, yes, he lives down in Skillman. Okay. And I would certainly suggest you talk about him. Okay, what did he do in your government before he took over your, the end of your mayoral? He was a uh, commission, uh, first he was a commissioner, one of the new five, and then he was a councilman. Oh, okay. Yes, he was council president. Okay. And, um, let's make a quick round now. We're the only two survivors. Um, Guess I don't know that Dick Sellers ever comes up. He's another J and J person. Yeah, John. but in all honesty, I mean John Heldrich knows it all. Yeah. I mean I did the uh, background. In fact, every time I see him, he tells me he still has that book for the Hartford Project and right. other. Um, possibilities and way to proceed and so on. Uh, you know, my thumb in the dike again, I guess. <laughs> um, he said Sellers was not well yeah. to be able to speak to him. Yeah. Okay. And you have Bob Campbell on the list. Yes, we're seeing um, him tomorrow, actually. So many well, if anyone dead. comes to mind. Yeah, I'm thinking of, um, of both Harvey and, um, well, Cecilia Paz has passed away. Monsignor is no longer with St. Uh, Peter's board. Who um, is Harvey? Tony Schrobel. Tony Schrobel is a very good one to talk to. He was president of the Franklin State Bank in these days. Oh. And I can't overemphasize the importance of the banks. Right. And the sadness I have in my heart with all the mergers. Schrobel, S-C-H-R-O-B. No R, no R. Schrobel. Let's see if I can write it down. It might be, don't hold me to it, S-C-H-O-E-B-E-L, Schrobel. Okay. okay. He lives in New Brunswick? No, they used to live a colony house, but since his wife died, he's I may be out with his um, son. I'm not sure where he lives right now, but um, he was president of the Franklin State Bank, and he was a colleague of Mayo Sisler's, and you have what their bank has evolved into 
right there. Bank right. of America? No, where the Y is now, or where the Y was, right next door. Next door. Yeah. I don't know what that bank is called. Oh, okay. But um, Mayo's office could probably get you his, his number, Tony okay. Schroble. Um, and um, I guess the Mudyar Savings Bank, Liz is too young. I mean, she's active now. I think she's on the Drew Street Playhouse. Reverend Hildebrand is deceased, um, but Rabbi Fields and um, he's affiliated with which institution? The temple up here on Livingston uh, Avenue. What's it on Chamath? The one on Livingston mm -hmm. Avenue. Mm -hmm. And um, everybody I know is dead. But those are a couple of names that come mm -hmm. to mind. I mean, they walk the streets with us. They are very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. Really. Just this one other aside while we're talking about banks, I'm just to stress how unfortunate we all are um, in not having bank headquarters Community in New banks. Jersey yes, right. and whatever. I did the first housing bond issue for the HFA in New Jersey. And just prior to that, they had the bond issue for the Meadowlands. And almost at the 11th hour, all the New York banks pulled out. Wow. And so we lost the fi financing for the Meadowlands. And the governor was able to call together the New Jersey banks, mm -hmm. and they were, I mean, otherwise it was dead. We were to be killed. Mm -hmm. And it was the New Jersey banks stepped up, and hence the Meadowlands got to be built. And uh, without taxpayer money, I might add. And then when they did the housing bond issue, that we offered it to the New Jersey banks, and we met right here in the New Brunswick City Hall. and. <clears throat> We had Bob Ferguson, uh, mm -hmm. Fidelity Bank. We had um, uh, First Jersey out of Jersey City, Tom. Oh, didn't matter. And there was another bank. Or States or Southern? No, I, I don't remember those particularly. I remember the two First Jersey and uh, Fidelity in Newark. And. Um, Commerce? No, it was before Commerce. Okay, I'm really old. Anyway, my point is, and some New York banks as well, and they met here, and um, they were introducing the bond issue, and we were talking about the state of New Jersey, and it couldn't be better. And you've never seen a group of grown men, I needless to say there were no women in the group, uh, sit on their hands, and the silence get longer and longer and longer. And it was, going to fail because we had no financing. And Tom, oh, his brother was a judge. Tom Stanton. Tom Stanton stood up and said, well, I'll buy 10 million. And that broke the log jam and we had a successful housing bond issue. There was no Tom Stanton. Well, it was just viewed as just too risky or too new? And who wanted to support housing in New Jersey? And you wouldn't get the bank president from North Carolina if they come hopping up here and buy it. Yeah, right. That's what I'm saying to you, uh -huh. that uh, uh, this international global reach that Rutgers, for one, is so <laughs> proud of, uh, leaves something in the dust in yeah. terms of community responsibility. Right. So I'm sorry, I took too long. And I, you know, I enjoyed running down memory.